In the 1960s, in the United States of America, a single African-American woman made a speech about how white Americans and black Americans can live together. She made a speech about a time when there would be equality that existed within the racist United States of America. In that time, she was slammed down by the government, she was considered politically incorrect, she was completely discredited. This is the side the side opposition is advocating. This is exactly the thing the side opposition does not want in today's debate. Because in essence, today's debate is about freedom of speech. It's about being able to express the politically incorrect, and it's about whether the government should be able to decide whether or not you can do that. So our stance in today's debate is that the government should not preemptively decide what is verbally acceptable, that society should always be self-regulating, that society should always be able to decide for itself. So we would therefore define tolerate as government tolerance. However, it must be noted here that government tolerance does not equal to government condoning, which means that government may not condone what is politically unacceptable. Sorry. However, it will not criminalize, nor would it be intolerant toward the expression of these opinions. Uh, we think that rather than criminalize politically incorrect speech, the government will instead step up on what is happening in status quo by encouraging multiculturalism, by encouraging tolerance, and by encouraging education. We will define public use, no thank you sir, as advertisements, political forums, and any uh, outlets of media, like the internet, where public discourse is held. Opposition must therefore show that if they do not want to tolerate uh, politically incorrect speech, they need to show how they're going to police these mediums, and they're also going to need to show how they will define what is politically incorrect in the first place. Because we think that's very ambiguous, we think that that's very hard to decide on. We will, we will finally define language as any discourse which is based on opinion, which is based on the underlying message. While politically incorrect is usually something which is, politi which is in political opposition or something that, or some opinions which, which are discriminatory and signifying wider underlying perceptions. So our yardstick for today's debate will be the side that ensures the collective welfare of society. And that will be the side that wins. I'm going to prove to you this through several, uh, several ways, but first, yes sir. Do you condone hate speech? Do you ban it? What do you do with hate speech? Thank you sir. In fact, we don't condone hate speech. As I've already said, we think that the government should not condone that, but we think hate speech needs to be expressed anyway. Because as we'll show you through our points, if you don't express hate speech, it becomes a dangerous thing. It's a sign of repression of views, and it drives hate speech underground. And we're going to show this to you in our case. Firstly, from my point about the freedom of expression. Secondly, on my point about the marketplace of ideas. What Gibi will talk to you about social backlash and empowering society. So on to my first point about the freedom of expression. Now the thesis of this point is that the freedom of expression is an essential right that keeps the government accountable and it can therefore not be regulated by the government. The freedom of expression is the first defense of a society against any government or any governmental abuse. It is therefore a basic right of any society that lives under a government. We think that it is therefore ridiculous that the government should, be, should not tolerate politically incorrect speech, should not tolerate anything that goes against its ideology. Because it is not the government's right to regulate this freedom of expression, we think this right is exclusive to society, and because this right is protection against the government, it should not be up to the government to choose whether to tolerate this kind of speech or not. In fact, we think that in, in expressing opposing viewpoints, in society express, expressing these opinions which oppose status quo, it is good, because it allows for, government, for society to be a check against the government. We saw the government clamping down on this kind of politically incorrect speech in 1989 in Tiananmen Square where a group of students gathered to talk about what was politically incorrect, to talk about the lack of rights in China. What did the government do? Under the pretext of their demonstration being politically incorrect, the government rolled the tanks into Tiananmen Square, running over the students, killing them and slaughtering all of them. Sure. This is the type of thing that we will not tolerate. This is the type of thing that the government cannot decide on. Because society needs to use this as a check against the government. We see that China now is still an oppressive regime that disallows political freedom, that disallows the freedom of expression under the pretext of what is politically incorrect. Furthermore, we think that the government cannot define what is politically incorrect in the first place because this would be subject to government abuse because when the government defines what is politically incorrect, it is always subject to the government increasing that definition, slowly but insidiously including more and more topics into that definition, slowly and insidiously becoming more and more strict, 
clamping down more and more onto what society says, onto what society thinks. We think that that is very dangerous. We think that that is a great amount of abuse which is open for the government to use. We think that if side opposition wants to oppose today's motion, they're going to have to give us a definitive answer about what really is politically incorrect. And that's something that we think is difficult to do. So on to the second point about the marketplace of ideas. Now the thesis of this point is that allowing politically incorrect speech creates a marketplace of ideas which is self-regulated and is superior to any form of government censorship which might exist. No, sir. Before that, yes. How exactly is the government helped by banning some ethnic discrimination words? How will he stop or being accountable? Sure. Now you see that if the government does ban this ethnic, uh, if the government does not allow for freedom of speech, the society can no longer express its views on government. If the government was in fact a government that did clamp down on ethnic violence, that society wouldn't be able to speak up. So therefore that very POI turns against you. Because in this case you're empowering someone who already has authority over someone who doesn't and you give society no amount of authority, no amount of power to check and balance. Therefore that POI doesn't stand. But instead, we say that in allowing politically incorrect language, what you do is you expose society, society to a plethora of views. You, mature, you create a mature society because of the marketplace of views that do exist. And within this marketplace, we do, we do see that the most of views that are expressed are moderate views. On the continuum of different views that are expressed, while there may exist extremists, we see that society is always made up of a majority of moderates. That these radical ideas that may be expressed within society are always balanced, are always condemned by a majority moderate view. No thank you sir. We saw this in Malaysia, where Islamic extremism and expression of this Islamic extremism calling for the burning of mosques, calling for the destruction of Hindu temples was actually uh, condemned by the rest of the, Islams, uh, the Islamic people in Malaysia, was condemned by the moderate Muslims in Malaysia and therefore no crimes actually took place because these moderate majority uh, condemned the very violence which was being espoused by the radical, uh, radical aspects of society. We think that when society condemns the radical views within it, they cr this creates a more powerful, a more meaningful regulation in government censorship. Because in government censorship, you allow the government to dictate what is right, what is wrong, but when society comes to that consensus itself, it creates a more mature society, it creates a more cohesive and more understanding society. And we think this more powerful and more mature society is worth achieving. We think that it's worth achieving when we tolerate politically incorrect speech. Furthermore, we think that when you allow for this public marketplace of ideas, you allow the government to track societal sentiment. Rather than driving this sentiment underground, you allow the government to be able to know what is societal perceptions, what is the level of extremism within, within society. We think this is something that would not be possible under their paradigm because they muzzle society, they muzzle the expression of these views, they disallow the government from ever being able to keep track of what societal views are and they drive these views underground, which my second speaker will show you is something which is very harmful, which is something that is going to hurt society even more. So by our own yardstick of achieving the collective benefit and the collective welfare of society, and by the fact that we create a more mature, more understanding society, we are so proud to propose. discrimination 
and difference between human beings and difference in the identity and in the dignity of human beings and we cannot stand for that as opposition. Now, what they did, what they did to it was something interesting. They started their speech telling you that, look, the state deciding what's so, hate speech, what, what's hate speech and things like that is something bad. But after that, they come and tell us the fact that, look, the people should decide, should decide on their own about us. What we're saying today is that these two things cannot happen. We're saying that we should have a state saying that, look, these things have been in our history and have propagated discrimination throughout our history and we cannot stand for this. So. What they're saying is, and they're basing their whole, their whole case on this idea of people being rational and the people being able to distinguish between good ideas and bad ideas. What we're telling you today is that discrimination does not apply to, to, to rationality. Discrimination uses logical fallacies that are able and are present in every human being and generalizations to appeal to the, more, to the less rational side of human beings. And this is what hate speech is doing today. This is what politically incorrect speech is doing. What we're going to do is take firstly a look at this problem of ideology and this problem of freedom of speech in the society. Secondly, we're going to tackle this idea of the marketplace of ideas in which Stop. it is not actually a marketplace of ideas but it is propagating the same discrimination throughout the society. And thirdly, I will answer the, our question our side's question, how do we maintain human dignity and how this mentality, the mentality of people is indeed influenced by language. Well, my second speaker will talk about the effects on the individual and how these individuals are rendered helpless by nature because this speech is allowed to propagate within the society. So let's get to the first idea, that of the free speech in the society. And they've made this whole lecture about free speech being the thing that matters inside the society. We're telling you, we're telling you yes, that's great, but what happens inside a publicly inside a public forum? Oh, thank you, sir. Is that this speech does not affect only people that agree to this? This speech affects those people that listen and those people condone of these ideas, and they're starting to spread this idea throughout the society. Therefore, people are discriminated. We're saying that freedom of speech is okay at law at, as long as no third party harm exists. And we have to understand that third party harm indeed exists and third party harm has been seen throughout the history of mankind because we've seen people that have been murdered during the Holocaust because these free speeches of politicians were allowed and we're seeing how people in African America have been able only lately to free themselves from the from so, the slavery that has been pertaining to society, they were able to free themselves because they could express their view, which is politically incorrect under your paradigm. No, sir. They have been able to free themselves because this because this uh, the state has seen that bad things happen to the society, that this discrimination can no longer be accepted because we are at the same at the core the same beings. This is what happened. And they've made this whole idea of the state you know, uh, censoring something to protect itself. We're saying the state that has no interest that has no interest in censoring some minority because the state is trying to protect all. They are making this false assumption that the state is somehow trying to go against its own population that they've not explained once. Now, let's get to the second point of the marketplace of ideas. We're, sell we're telling you that, again, people are not rational. They don't think rationally about discrimination. And I will deal with this point further on in my second part of the society. But let's get to the first point of the society. And the act is about dignity. And this is basically in what we believe. We believe that there should be no separation so, between human beings. And I will deal with this after this POI. Please, sir. So, we see this precisely that both sides kind of agree on what politically incorrect vision is. That proves it's so hard that governments can abuse it, they can interpret it their own way, and we think you should even try. 
Sir, what we're telling you today is that we can agree upon how political dis uh, how this discrimination happens throughout society, and we agree to the fact that this words like nigger and this words like retard and this words like idiot are things that propagate discrimination throughout the society. But I will deal with this further on in my second point, as I've talked about. Now, the thing we have to understand today is that this, these politicians are actually models for the people in the society, and media are models for the people in the society. Meaning that if these peoples have the power to legislate within their own countries, then they become the peoples that hold the power of the people. Meaning that the people will look up to them and will see that this is the way that we should behave. What we're saying further on is that if these ideas are public, publicly exposed, they appeal, and this is the second point, they appeal to work, to people that have so, no distinct idea. They, they're not thinking about these the, this category of people is bad in a way, or this category of people is good in some way. No, they have no, they have no opinion about this. But when somebody comes and uses this flaw of discrimination, of appealing to a person in the matter of illogical thinking, then this discrimination comes to the point that everyone thinks that because somebody told them that immigrants take up all their jobs, then immigrants must be taking up all their jobs. You can try to combat them in about 30 sentences, but they will still believe that immigrants are taking the, their jobs because some politicians told them that, because somebody that was able to speak in a public forum was able to tell them that. What we're telling you moral is that this is a, a, an unwritten law that things propagate within the society by the speech of these people. And we're saying moreover that if the law manages to influence the mentality of the people, then this law should be accepted. Because if in the beginning we had people that were writing laws in rock because they found out that those things are bad, right now we write laws and the mentality of people changes around them. So by all means, oppose. Today, I'll be very offended because they think I'm a sheep 
They think that I cannot distinguish the things from myself, that, sure. that I cannot ex uh, have access to the kind of information, to filter the kind of information and make a moderate and rational choice. We think that's not true. We think furthermore society has proven time and time again that they can be against radicalization. We give you an example of the KKK in America, which used to be very radical. However, now it is condemned in the public. Why? Because a large majority, majority of society understands that this is wrong. And we think that they really underestimate your society today. We think that's not good. We challenge them to give us a, an example of how society can't do this. We sure. say they cannot that's do so. Right. No, thank you, sir. Furthermore, we think that we create a more tolerant society in our world. Why is it so? Because people are exposed to new ideas, people are exposed to a plethora of ideas, and therefore what happens is uh, they, uh, they, uh, they can actually be more moderate. We give you an example of Denmark, where after the Prophet Muhammad cartoons, we see that the Muslims in Denmark weren't the one revolting. It wasn't the Muslims that were revolting, who were in places like Afghanistan, in Iraq, highly oppressive regimes. Clearly there is a correlation here, that when you grant free speech, people will have the ability to be more moderate, people will have the ability to reject what is radical. No, thank you. Then let's talk about this second idea, which was the bulk of their uh, substantive today, on how basically free speech would encourage discrimination. When a politician goes out there, he, he is going to propagate even more discrimination, you encourage things like murder, they give us an example sure. of Germany, and how would we actually propagate even more discrimination. Let's deal with that. Well, firstly, we think that the government duty to the people is also about the freedom of individuality, freedom of expression, because it is your opinions and it is your personality. And therefore, every single sure. person which holds an answer should, should still have a right to express themselves freely. Yes, sir. Please explain us. Why exactly a person cannot explain his opinion via rational words and not by words like die, nigga, die? Thank you, sir. Well, look here. We understand that these are very radical views. But you also have to understand that there's always going to be radical people in every society. So the question then is, how do you deal with it? Do you shut them out, let them go underground, you deny them a proper voice, and therefore they resort to more radical means, they turn to arms. Sure. We give you an example of the Muslim Brotherhood who did precisely this. Or we embrace it, we let it go out in the open, we let the public condemn it, we let society regulate it. We think ours is the better one, we deal with the root of the problem. So let's go back to this idea of free speech, no thank you. Where, okay, we think that even if so, we think that if um, the kind of free speech were to actually sure. encourage some form of, of murder in their side, we think that's what policing is for. That's why you have strong policing in governments. That if somebody, an individual, would tangibly harm another individual in society, your police is there to enforce. And we think that this is very different from freedom of speech. That if you do have free speech, we will not condemn you for it. But the moment you act on that and you harm someone, we will. Yeah, so that's the difference. Moreover, we think that again, they encourage more radicalization, which is something I'm going to talk about even more in my substantive today. But before that, we have to recognize that their side is something that pro that's propagating a nanny state, a very draconian state. Because according to their side, words like idiot can't even be said in public. If I say that, I'll be thrown in jail. We think that's extremely ridiculous, and we don't think that many people in this room would be a free man in their world today then. So let's talk about uh, two main substantives today. Then. Firstly, on social backlash. Secondly, on empowering society. Now my first point is that such a thesis here is that what happens when you tolerate politically incorrect language is that you prevent a societal backlash because radicals cannot go underground when they have a proper, legitimate, legal means of expressing themselves. Sure. And in that their case will be far worse when you repress these people. Why is it so? What is the root of religious radicalization? We see it only occurs when the government shuts them up, when there is no legal, legal avenue for them to express themselves. Uh, they go on the ground, they arm, where, because they have to seek alternative means of spreading their message. Sir. We give you the example of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which was shut out by the government because they were politically incorrect. What happened then? They turned to the militant wing, they turned to arms. That's something far more dangerous. And what we see here is that they reaffirm this perception that the government is oppressive. They fuel all these radical groups because now they have a justification to propagate their radical messages. And we think it's far worse. However, we see now, in the moderate setting of the world today, when the Muslim Brotherhood is allowed to go out there in public, we see that they've become less moderate, they've even dropped their militant wing. Obviously, in this case, we see a more freer society. In our side, we see that when we allow free speech, we see that all these radical groups won't be as radical. Furthermore, we think it's better for these views 
quarter minister to be out in the open, where the government can regulate instead of underground, where you don't know who are all these radicals. Yes, sir. Well, sir, if people are so so smart, how can they cannot they tell the difference between for, between speech and hate speech, even when hate speech is regulated, and we don't see this happening because we see all these neo-Nazi movement in Germany and in other countries. We realize that in the context of today, the neo-Nazi movement has diluted greatly. Why? Because of societal condemnation. Why? Because um, many governments have already uh, encouraged uh, educational campaigns against it. And therefore we think society has become more moderate. It's precisely your example that supports our instance. So let's quickly move on then to the second idea of empowering society, where the thesis here is that when you tolerate um, more all these incorrect languages, you encourage a more tolerant and progressive society. Why? Because we talked about this idea where you're exposed to the thorough of views, and where most successful, stable civil societies are the least restricted. Again, the example of Denmark shows this, where again the Prophet Muhammad cartoons showed more radical reactions in places like Afghanistan, in Iraq. Clearly, exposure does a very good thing in educating the people and ensuring that they don't resort to things like creating political unrest whenever they meet such content. It is a greater exposure to society. Moreover, in the long run, we think it's good for the education of society for them to be exposed to so many views, to the opposition's views. We see that if you don't, what happens is a political apathy. Why? Because the government is the only one giving you the message. You only hear what from the government, everything that's a bad thing. So because they encourage a more regressive society, because they encourage more radicalization, and because we are concerned with the welfare of society, we think it's clear that our side exists. Mr. Speaker, today, what the government team is doing is trying to base their entire case on this idea that government would profit from censoring some words while never explaining exactly how not using some words will ever help a government into keeping hold of its power. They only try to mimic some sort of logical argument by trying to escape through this idea of freedom of speech as helping uh, uh, as not helping the government, but in the end, they haven't actually shown us. If a person says this word, then that government will uh, will be in a worse position. That means that that government may, may be weakened. That means that that government will, may want to shut down this world. They haven't shown us this thing, and we are really upset that they haven't tackled this problem that we brought up. Second of all, they haven't really tackled our, uh, most of our idea about human dignity and how discrimination discrimination actually propagates. And this will be my the focal point of my case, showing exactly how in so, our world people will feel better than in their world. And I'm going to do that by tackling four major points. First one is thinking shortcuts. Second one is pre expressing things. The third one is government capability. And the last one is helping the helpless, which is in fact my part of the case. Now, let's talk about thinking shortcuts. Because a um, very, very big part of their argumentation relies on this very, very shallow idea that people are completely rational. They're like some sort of computers that think everything completely so, logical and therefore they are absolutely never uh, they are absolutely never affected by words. But in the end, each word has a background behind that thing. Even the word crippled makes you think of a person who is, first of all, incapable of moving, who is incapable of taking so, care of himself, a person who is inferior to other people. It is something inherent to each and every one of us, and each of these kind of words makes you think about such a thing. And, the th the, and, that, and what that means is that it is extremely easy for a person to make a logical uh, statement about crippled people having to uh, be isolated in some sort of 
facilities in which they are held 24-7 only because they mention the word crippled. And this is, in fact, the base of our argument, the fact that people do not think completely rational. People actually think in shortcuts, and these shortcuts are words. Yes, sir. If you're so against the word crippled, tell me now how you're going to police it and stop society from using the word crippled all over the board. Well, sir, it is not really the problem of me doing this in this room or another person doing that on the street. First of all, it is extremely impossible to actually stop this. Second of all, uh, it doesn't really have an effect. We're talking about huge political speeches, and this will be my, the third point of my speech. But now, they, we have brought up the idea that when, if they actually say that people are so smart that they can actually figure out the difference between uh, a word which is incriminatory for a person and an actually natural word, so, then how, why exactly do they, uh, if people are so smart that they can get it, how, it, why exactly can't we censor it? Because in that moment, people will still get the idea, although we, uh, that person uses a word like crippled or idiot or retard or not. Even if it, uh, if a person is smart, yeah. even if it, is, if it says crippled, crippled or physically impaired, it will be the same thing. No thanks, sir. This is my second point, which is the point of expressing. Because they stated this idea of freedom of speech as this absolute uh, value that has absolute no other uh, meaning, uh, no other point than stopping the government from abusing its people, but at the same time haven't actually shown us how exactly is this done. And we believe that expressing ideas, yes, does help people. It stop. It makes people realize that some things are abusive and some things are not abusive because they share arguments, because they think logically. And this is the main idea be behind freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is helpful when it expresses a logical idea that leads people to so actually realizing some logical things that are good or are not good. No thanks, sir. And because of that, when you're talking about words that have absolutely nothing to do with rationality, when you're talking about ethnic insults or racial insults that have nothing to do with rationality but are, are more to the part of taking shortcuts, as I have said to you, it is absolutely no harm to the idea of freedom of speech if you're using it or if you're not using it. In fact, a smart person that can actually profit from freedom of speech would get the idea a lot better if you would say sure. medically impaired, which is a lot more descriptive than if you said crippled. Yes, sir. How governments would interpret politically incorrect depends on various governments. Say if the North Korean government interprets it, then any wow. kind of political dissent will be suppressed. Well, sir, How do you not this is, this is my, that my third point which I am just explaining right now. Because your whole idea is that governments will never do anything to stop it. But your own examples about the idea that African Americans are not as uh, abused right now and are not as discriminated right now is because America has now a policy of not allowing people to say uh, discriminatory words in public. Because, and this only shows the fact that yes, governments will actually go and will do these kind of things. And if we're talking about abusive governments, uh, well, this is not the actual debate that we're talking about. Because this debate is about rational governments that actually do not do any other uh, sort of propaganda and want the good of their people. And even if we're talking about irrational governments, no government on this side of the planet wants its uh, citizens to back to be actually unhappy because this weakens their power. And if you're creating the ethnic dissensions or any sort of dissension in your society, you're actually weakening so, your power. And what this shows, uh, uh, with the idea that no government would ever profit from banning your word, actually real uh, makes us show the fact that governments really do not want to uh, stop words, which uh, so uh, to stop. Irrational words, and how will they choose? Well, it's uh, it's quite simple for a government to choose a word which is uh, so obviously discriminatory, because in the end, these words are about thinking shortcuts, shortcuts that each and every one, including the government staff, use. And this brings me to my last point: is helping the helpless, because in the end, we are talking about today the people that go on the television and see a, uh, a politician talking about them and not being able to do absolutely anything about it. They are not able to stop that person on the television. And because this kind of uh, thinking shortcuts are so embedded in everyone's mind, it is extremely 
uh, hard for them to use logic for them to actually battle these things. And in this situation, when these people are so helpless, when their entire dignity is actually confronted with this idea, their entire social enclosure and their, their need of of, being, of belonging to a society is at jeopardy. And because of that, they are discriminated in the end by the government because it's not doing something. Uh, what we want from our side of the government, of the panel, of the board, is to actually do, uh, make the government do something for these people which are also a citizens. So today I've told you that state doesn't want to stop any words. I've told you that the state actually doesn't profit from talking in that words. I've told you that people are not completely rational. They're taking shortcuts, especially when regarding language. i told you that in the end, freedom of speech is about logical thinking and not about thinking shortcuts. And because of that, because we believe that uh, this kind of words have nothing to do with freedom of speech, I beg you to oppose this motion. Everyone here can see that it's clearly a very messy debate because obviously they have an issue with us trying to talk about a bigger case. They want to talk about a scenario where I can't call someone a retard, where hate speech will be allowed if it is logical. For example, if I give a reasonable explanation of why immigration policy hurts locals. They only want to debate in rational countries. We tell you that's not what happens. We tell you that you have to debate in the real world where you have countries like Egypt, like China, which are free to define political incorrect speech as much as they are. So we say that this is the true context of today's debate. We tell them, stop running from it, start debating with us. So let's look at today's debate, but before that, let me talk about the evaluative element of this. So far, our owners has been, which side best protects society? What have they really said so far? They came up in their first speaker and after a very long and complicated series of rebuttals, gave it a single point that people are sheep, that if someone says, hey, Muslims are bad, 80% of my population will jump up and go and lynch them. We told you, no, they're not. People can think for themselves. We see the reality of the situation where yes, you have extremists on both sides, but the people in the middle, these people are borders. These people generally like to live in a peaceful society where they don't have to be afraid of being attacked in the middle of the night. These are the people which truly constitute society today. So that's not really true. Then let's look at the principal clash. We told you from the start that this is basically a debate between government preemptive censorship and societal condemnation. We have stuck to our guns and we've shown you the clash as it should exist and the clash which it have hindered has existed. But they haven't really come back and engaged with us on these grounds. So we tell them also that you have a superficial belief that simply because I can't call someone a triple, I can't call someone a retard, I, you're going to immediately remove all these discriminations simply because people can't hear about them. We think this is very magical and, and quite every belief that they have that simply because I can't talk about something, it won't exist. We tell you that's not true in the real world. So what happens they don't in today's debate? Our entire speech on government accountability, sure. they step under the cupboard on the defense that that's not the debate about today because that's not what the definition is about. Ignoring the fact that their definition challenge wasn't truly really sustained in their second speaker. We told you about the idea of a marketplace of ideas sure. that number one, you have societal condemnation. But obviously if I want to be and call someone a cripple and he's in a wheelchair, people are going to say I'm a terrible person. So obviously I won't. No response to this. We talked about the reason of monitoring, of regulation, where if an Islamic person would say, I want to bomb the United States, and then he goes and does it. At least in this situation, we know who he is, sure. because we've been monitoring him for some time. Once again, no response. Then we talked to you about the idea of a social backlash, of radicalization. Obviously, when you sweep things like this under the carpet, nobody solves them. Sure. They ignore it, and once again, as is very characteristic of their policy, pretend that the problem didn't exist. Then we're talking about encouraging a tolerant society. 
that basically now they let people speak up, they will want to be politically active. Once again, no response. Yes, sir. Well, sir, the fact is that in the real world, discrimination actually exists, and you're not doing anything to tackle this because your people, as we have proven, are not entirely rational as you're trying to. Sir, we agree with you. We agree that discrimination will exist in both scenarios. The question is, who then best deals with it? Is it our side which draws out to open? Let's the majority of the modern society say that it's not nice to call someone a nigger, it's not nice to call someone um, a retard or a cripple, or the other side which says, you know what, let's just not talk about it at all. We say so our side clearly deals with the issue much, much, much better. So, they tell us at the start that, you know what, in the United States, I can't, sorry, that, yeah, let, let me just move on quickly to the specific issue. So, let's quickly really deal with and clear the issue of the death social challenge. We basically said that it is so difficult to interpret what political correct and correctness means as is obviously by the fact that we have a definite challenge here. So we said that if governments like the outside are truly rational, that's great. But in the real world, we have people like China who would like to interpret political correctness to mean that words like Tiananmen Square will be blocked on like Google search engines. These are the kind of situations we are talking about. Sorry. This kind of situation that we pretend that doesn't exist, we say they aren't really debating us in any situation. Then we tell them that even then, although you make situations where people call each other idiots and learn, sure. how exactly are you going to deal with it? They admitted and considered that, well, we can't. So we say if their side is already failing and so impotent, which side then best deals the problem? Is it our side which draws these people out and then condemns them, or the other side which pretends that the situation simply doesn't exist whatsoever? So we already see that despite all these things, we have still engaged them on their very narrow ground of calling people idiots or calling people niggas. Well, they have actually ignored the rest of our entire proposition case, if you remember. So, let's look at the real issues of this debate. First of all, can society regulate itself? And this is really their entire speech because throughout it, they've really only had one or two substantives. So, what have they said so far? They said that people, when they see their political leaders go up and talk about how Muslims are bad, will basically fall heads over, head over heels for these arguments because people are irrational, because people can't think. But we say that this is underestimating the intelligence of your average modern citizen who already is exposed to a multi polarity of views, who already sees views from different parts of society, and therefore is unlikely to simply believe someone because they tell him that Muslims are bad. We say in the real world, people may not be very rational, sir, but they are somewhat reasonable. And we say that it is in this modern, global, and normal situation where they have to debate this. They didn't come back to us on this issue, yes, sir. It goes to our side. Then they basically said that. Well, in any case, we still think it's bad and that people go up and call cripples and idiots. We told you that on our side, obviously, even if I go to the United States, where for their information, it is perfectly legal to call anyone anything you want. If I go to the United States and I walk into Harlem and I say, hey nigga, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to get beaten up. So for this very reason, I'm not going to want to say that because I understand that society has condemned these words. That society already exists and that there's already some kind of existing infrastructure which says that some words simply unnecessary. But we say that the difference between our side and their side is in our situation, we let the people choose what words should and shouldn't be used. Their side says, let's let the government do it because the government always knows what's best. In their side, China always knows what's best. In their side, Egypt always knows what's best. We don't think that's true in the real world. So then, we've talked to them about the idea of driving, the people, of driving these radicals underground, which is basically that you engender more radicalization because now they can't add their views. What have you said to this? No response once again. So we see that really their case is quite small and is quite flawed. So, to summarize today's debate sir. in total, yes, sir. Okay, you're talking about debating on the real world, but you're only giving examples of, as countries like China. What we're telling you is that discrimination exists even in countries like Denmark and countries from Europe. Thank you for that, sir. Let's talk about Denmark. Does anybody here remember the Danish Prophet Muhammad cartoons that came out a few years ago? What happened in this situation? We saw that people in the very oppressed societies, like in Libya, like in Iran, reacted very violently. They would protest, they burned down the Danish embassy. But what happened in Denmark? The Muslims there reacted very peaceably, very reasonably. They lodged a complaint and they held debates about the role of Islam in the modern world today. So, our entire speaker's speech and clearly they didn't listen on how tolerant societies, in fact, when they allow for a multiplicity of views, these are the kind of societies where there are social problems of people bashing each other with religion don't exist. Because when I'm free to add my views, I can move the conflict from one of a physical one to 
a war of swords to war of words. And that is where we want to see the true conflict today's debate. Clearly something they fail to understand. So really, our side has debated on their very narrow ground and still continue to show us and show you why our side is still superior. They have still failed to start doing either. Thank you. 
people being rational, we saying that people are not rational. People in France are Man. discriminating Muslims because government tells them to do so. People in France are not rational about discriminating people, and nobody really does something about it. Further, we're saying that that if people would use neutral words, and if you ban these kind of people, and if you ban these kind of words, people would be able to filter themselves information. And this leads me perfectly to, to my next point, which is if people can't really filter the message. And we're saying that no. First of all, because of what I've already explained. Because words carry this mentality of people being different, and of people being Madam. legitimately discriminated in a second, by legitimately discriminated by the majority, yes. Madam, you see that even in France, you do have local French people opposing the Burqa ban. So can yes. you stop about this? I don't understand your point of question. And yes, we're saying that is a minority. And we're saying that the majority you're supporting, the majority you're saying it's, it's rational, it's not really that rational. And we need to deal with this problem right now. Further, we're saying that words carry mentality, words change the mentality of people. And having politicians legitimately calling people names mm -hmm. and legitimately saying, uh, and legitimately saying these kind of words, people will think that it's legitimate for them to do so. People will think that these politicians <coughs> do have that right to do so. Therefore, we need to ban it in order to not let discrimination propagate. Further on, in the society, we're saying that these words are subliminal, are not explicit, and people are not that smart because they cannot even tell when discrimination, uh, when discrimination happens in, in, in speeches in which it is not that explicit. <laughs> no, thank you. That's why we think that when discrimination is going to be explicit in their speeches, then people will really believe that it's legitimate to discriminate that people. Further on, public pressure doesn't work because the majority does not think the same, because individuals are subjective, because some individuals will think so, and some individuals will think the other way. We say this is going to happen, and we have a few fanatics, like they told us, if we we'll let them propagate their message. Further on, we have a greater number of people propagating the same message and really thinking that discrimination is legitimate. Further on, I'm going to talk about my last point, that is government. We're saying that the government has uh, has a right to impose this. And the only response they, they brought to us is that the government will not be able Madam. no thank you, will not be able to sort out which is discrimination, which is not. And if that's the problem, then we're gonna solve that problem and we're gonna sort it out. The fact is that the government really needs to do something because the society will not be able to control each and every individual who will uh, discriminate on this kind of basis. Therefore, we're saying that the government will do so because it has been trusted. Because social dissensions and social tensions destroy the state and destroy the society. Therefore, the government will have all the, no thank you, will have all the interest of solving these kind of tensions. Further on, we're saying that instead of weakening the society and instead of weakening uh, instead of weakening how the society works inside that country, it's better for the government to do so. They're not doing that in order to shut down the people just because they're not okay with what they're saying. They, they're doing that, this because they're, it's safer. They're doing this, be, this because they need to save the society from being crumbled from inside. So, in the end, in the end, what we're told is that what they brought to you are extreme examples. What they brought to you are not, is not the reality. All countries have discrimination. Countries which really lobby for human rights have a lot of discrimination within their societies. And what we need to do is to sort out that problem. And what we need to do is not to have extreme words, extreme words, and not to have human dignity destroyed by these kind of people. We're saying that further on, that the, that the impact on these people who are discriminated is huge because they cannot do anything about it. Because, because if it would be, if, if it was legitimate, then people would have, would stand no chance from being the same as the other categories. 